Isabel Clouter, a sound hunter and oral archivist, continues her journey around the globe in search of disappearing sounds. Today, she's in Russia on the trail of an incredible invention. I've come to Russia on the next part of my journey to discover disappearing sounds. A country where the importance of sound as an active element of Russian cultural life took on a new meaning after the revolution. The Russian futurists celebrated the advent of the industrial age with large concerts featuring the sounds of the new machines. This marked a time of great experimentation in all the arts and in particular in music, where the desire to form new styles spawned a whole generation of instruments capable of making strange sounds. One of the most advanced machines from the 1930s still survives. Known as the ANS machine, it lies hidden deep in the bowels of the Moscow University, underground and far below the society that inspired its creation. The ANS synthesizer is the only instrument of its kind a drawn sound instrument that transfers light into sound. Its name comes from the initials of Alexander Nikolaevich Skryabin, the celebrated Russian composer to whom the inventor Eugene Mertzin dedicated his invention. One of the last remaining machines from the electronic legacy of experimental music that was formed far from Western eyes at the turn of the 20th century. Having narrowly escaped destruction twice and its destiny uncertain, I was in a hurry to capture the sounds of this remarkable polyphonic instrument and to talk to its only surviving operator, Stanislav Krejci. My only link to the ANS came through the director of the Theremin Institute, Andrei Shmanov. His passionate interest in the evolution of electronic music in Russia led to the creation of the Theremin Institute, which is at the heart of electronic music in Russia and beyond. I arrived just as it was about to host Alta Medium 2, an electronic music festival with a difference. The festival marks a continuation of a tradition which has its roots in the works of the Russian and Italian futurists at the beginning of the 20th century, which was where this journey began two years ago when I was searching for the earliest recordings of the work of the Russian avant-garde and futurist sound art movements. The influences of industrialization and political change were responsible for some of the largest scale avant-garde musical performances and sound sculptures in Russia, a celebration of new beginnings. Attitudes towards a new music changed dramatically during the course of the century with some catastrophic results, sending much of the music and musicians underground. During my search I found that their earliest recordings had literally gone up in smoke and all that remained were some of the instruments from the early experiments, and it was these that I was now searching for. Travelling with me was sound artist Rob Mullinder, who was taking part in the Altamedian Festival. We arrived at the Theremin Institute to meet with the director, Andrei Shmernov, the man who was the contact for Stanislav Krejci. I asked Andrei how important the development of new instruments was to early experimental music in Russia. We didn't have electronic musical instruments at that time in the 20s, so they called it auto musical instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly it was um, mechanical stuff, uh, el electromechanical stuff. They were very, inter very interested in building special uh, sorts of um, instruments produ to produce uh, modern uh, 12 steps per octave, like a quarter tone or one third of tone uh, instruments. So. Finally, it uh, came to this uh, development of other synthesizing, you know, microtonal devices, and when, when, when it comes exactly to the point when it comes to spectrums. Mm -hmm. But uh, there were only a few places where it was supported by state. And most uh, Russian inventors of uh, musical instruments, electronic musical instruments, in different times, they uh, worked here. Anything private was prohibited. 
So you could uh, you, you was a part of the state, and you could uh, having a st state salary and uh, have official job. And uh, if some specializations, some subjects are not included in the state uh, list, you cannot do that. All country was working somehow on the ground <laughs> at the time, <laughs> <laughs> developing a, a sort of uh, interesting things. It was on the border of, of uh, criminal, because to build any new instruments, you had to get components, you had to get some um, money, and uh, it was impossible again officially. And even though in, you, you could not buy any electronic components, you had to stole them from uh, institutions again, <laughs> because only they could have them. This, this was a common, common, common system, common structure. Of course, each uh, inventor was a criminal. Otherwise, he could not invent anything. And so for the development of the ANS machine, was this in a similar vein? Or? Well, uh, ANS, I think, was really successful because Evgeny Muzin uh, was not waiting for any support from the state from the very beginning. He was just uh, doing his uh, work like a hero himself with his uh, wife and his private house. and. Otherwise, he could uh, wait uh, dozens of years uh, for state support without any success. There's only so much you can say about a musical instrument without playing it. As soon as Andre received a call that Stanislav was ready, we headed off to find the legendary machine, lurking in a disused part of the basement of the University of Moscow. In the last room at the end of a corridor, through a series of locked doors, we finally arrived in a little studio where the ANS stands. From the appearance of the ANS, it's not difficult to imagine that Mertzen was an engineer. It has a feel of something rather old and industrial. It looks like a cross between a Wurlitzer jukebox and an old printing press. Stanislav flicked some switches, and the sleeping beast slowly came to life. A moment Rob and I had been waiting for for a long time. OK, the way the machine works is, in front of me we have a, a large plate of glass covered in opaque mastic. Now, behind this glass, there are spinning five photo-optic discs. These discs have a waveform printed on them, and they spin round at a given speed. Now, the way that the waveforms are printed means that the lower discs towards the bottom of the, what we call the, the drawing field, give you a low frequency, all the way up to a very high frequency at the top. And we have uh, 720 microtones, or if you like, very small steps on the musical scale. Where you scratch through the mastic, in other words, where the, where the light shines through, that's essentially where your tone is. So you have a bank of photocells in front of the glass, so now if I switch on the machine using this large foot switch. Okay. Now I've drawn some very, very low squiggles to give us our bass notes and some very, very high ones. So I've got a little wheel here which I turn by hand. There is also an automatic feed and it's winding the glass plate between the, the glass discs and the photo cells. And as you can hear, where the light's shining through, that's the very high ones. And there come our bass notes. And so it literally plays just what you draw. You can draw absolutely anything on it. And because it's microtonal, there are no steps, or no audible ones at least. sweeps in tone, absolutely anything. It's very, very versatile and it's instantaneous. And those medium tones are just a zigzag I drew in the center of the plate. It sounds very sci-fi. And how fast you do it, doesn't alter the pitch because the pitch is determined by where your marks are on the plate. So there we 
we are, just backwards and forwards. Very intuitive, very simple. The ANS machine was developed between 1938 and 1963, a real labour of love from a determined inventor. What evolved was one of the most amazing advances of its time. While in Russia, Mertzin was developing his experimental music machine in secret and with great difficulty, the developments in the American electronic music scene were quite slow, considering the relative ease of access to equipment and funds. I asked Andre if he knew whether Mertzin was aware of the developments of electronic music in the West at this time. In this laboratory, uh, I found in the archives uh, a lot of translations from uh, articles from all over the world, mostly from America. Some article uh, public published, and in half a year we have been here, we have a translation. It was very, very fast, and I was really surprised how, how fast uh, they could get information here in the uh, 30s and 40s and even 50s about uh, everything was which, what was going on in, in, in the world. So, somehow they were very good informed. But the information about the ANS machine being and musical developments in Russia were they kept more more secret? From, well, from let's say that this information was here at the physical mm. laboratory, and of course uh, only uh, very very uh, small uh, circle of people could uh, uh, had access to it. After the death of Stalin, attitudes towards the developments in Russian electronic music slowly changed as did the fortunes of many of the inventors. It's through the work of Artemyev and others that the ANS came to the attention of the Soviet artistic circles and was used by eminent filmmakers like Tarkovsky for the soundtracks to his film Solaris, The Stalker and The Mirror. In Solaris, the voice of the ANS machine becomes that of the ocean, a giant conscious and reasoning organism with which the scientists on the space station are trying to make contact. Even you can synthesize on the computer much uh, cleaner, and much more sophisticated sounds, but uh, you cannot create this, you know, this sort of tactile yeah. <laughs> uh, interaction with the sound with this object, huge, huge, beautiful object with this drawing on your score in real time. Oh, it's the, completely, completely special. The most uh, interesting thing is uh, the direct uh, communication uh, between drawing and sounding. The developments in Russian electronica continue in a highly sophisticated manner. The theremin is used both in performances and new interactive computer programs where sound takes on new forms. The Alta Medium Festival brought together musicians and artists from all over the globe still experimenting in these genres. At the forefront of these were some of the newest musical talents from Russia. The results were fantastic and inspiring. The legends live on. The Sound Hunter was presented by Isabel Clouter with recordings by Rob Mullender. The producer was Sarah Taylor.